Hello everybody and welcome back to the second shelf. Happy Easter for all of you who celebrate Easter. It's Easter Sunday, 1st of April and uh, no, no April's Fools video, but the usual Sunday recent reads video formerly known as Books Weekly. I have four books I want to chat with you about, and the first one is this, Rafia Zakaria's The Upstairs Wife, An Intimate History of Pakistan, first published in 2015. Now, if you're following my channel uh, for a little bit, then you might remember my f video end of February, where I presented you with a couple of books and asked you which books book to pick next for me to read. Um, and this one was the second book. So I read this in, in March. Um, Thanks to your uh, comments and voting for the book. And the next one, by the way, will be The Gadfly. Anyway, so Rafia Zakaria, uh, I came across her. She's a Pakistani um, lawyer, political philosopher, writer of nonfiction. And I came across her work. Um, you might remember last year when I read um, a short little essay called Veil, where she um, explores the implications of women uh, wearing the veil or not. She herself had been wearing it and then not, so on and off. And I really loved this book. I thought it was very intelligent and very illuminating. And then I decided to read uh, the book she previously published, um, which is, like it said, it's a, it's a history, an intimate history of Pakistan combined with a memoir of herself, uh, her family. She has a twin brother, Said, um, but the central figure in her family is Amina, her aunt, so the sister of her father. Um, and the book spans the family history from just after the Indian independence in 1947 until um, uh, the assassination of uh, uh, Benazir Bhutto in 2007. Um, Rafia's family is Indian from originally a Muslim Indian family, and they moved to Pakistan in the 1960s after the partition because, you know, their fear of how Muslims were going to be treated in India. So it's an, although it says an intimate history of Pakistan, it's also the, you know, Indian liberation, um, independence, and then the partition and the civil unrest and civil wars that, that followed. Um, and she combines that with the personal history of her family. I really thought it was it was a really very good book, very interesting. I, I know shamefully little about Indian and Pakistan history. So for me, it was really very educational. Um, and I especially liked the way um, uh, Zakaria was able to combine the personal history of her family, especially the position of women, with the history of Indian, India and Pakistan. But if you're looking for a typical memoir kind of style, this will not be your book. It's much more a non-fiction account uh, about the history of a country. Although Amina, the aunt, is a central figure, um, it's, it's not a memoir in the strict sense of the word. So if you are looking for that, then I don't think this would be a book for you. But if you are interested in a really intelligently and well-written account uh, of Pakistan, the history of Pakistan, with some personal um, family history in between, then I can certainly highly recommend this book. The second book I want to talk to you about is also non-fiction, and that is Mary Beard, Women and Power, published in December of last year, so it's fairly new. Um, now, Mary Beard, you probably know, she is an English uh, writer and professor of classics at Cambridge. She was born in 1955, and she's most famous for her um, uh, non-fiction work on ancient Rome, um, the classics, the Greek. She wrote many books about that, thick, you know, non-fiction books. If you're into that, you should ch certainly check it out. But she's also quite a well-known feminist. Um, and in 2014 and 2017, she gave two lectures, uh, both on women and power. And the book is the written-down account of these lectures. Um, so there are two 
essays. It's a quite a short a book and the cover is a little psychedelic. I hope you're not going to get go woozy on me here. Um, but anyway, it's, it's quite a short book. So two short little essays. The first one is the public is about the public voice of women in which uh, Beard explores uh, in, in, through literature, starting from um, um, the Odyssey, uh, she, she explores the position women had in public life and whether or not their voices were heard. Uh, and of course, the answer is not really. Um, uh, the second uh, essay is Women and Power. And there she explores also, with the help of classic literature, but uh, also the, the actual life of women, real life women, uh, how we treat women in a position of power. I thought it was good. Both essays were good. Um, but... I liked the first one much more than the second one because I thought that was something, you know, new, uh, a new kind of perspective, looking at women's voices in literature and in real life, um, which really made you think about how we um, perceive women when they talk in public, um, uh, not only what their position is when they do that, but she adds tidbits of, for instance, uh, uh, the women's appearance, whether they try to be less feminine when they speak in public, whether they try to lower their voices, for instance, because the public domain is a male domain. That's her, her claim, be its claim. And I thought this was really very interesting because it taught me something uh, about the position of women and why um, feminism is important. The second essay, Women in Power, was interesting, but I thought it was a little vague. She didn't really, for me at least, she didn't really get to the point how uh, we should alter the, the way we perceive women in power. So I, I thought it was an interesting essay, but not brilliant. Whereas the first one, The Public Voice of Women, I thought was really yeah, brilliant. It was intelligent and, and gave a new kind of perspective on the issue. But still, uh, if you're interested in, in you know, the, the feminist position and uh, the, the, the subject of women in power, it's, it's certainly worthwhile, although uh, I think it's too expensive. Uh, in, in Europe, it's, it's 13 euros. And I, I would have wished that a book like that would have been made, you know, accessible to more people. Um, but still, like I said, if you're interested in the subject, I can recommend it, and especially the first of the two essays. We stay with nonfiction, and the next book is um, also heavy lifting, like the title of the video indicates. So they're all books with subjects that are not easy. Uh, not easy going, and that is Rainy Edo Lodge, Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race, published um, in December of 2017, and it won uh, the UK Prize for the best book written by a person of color just the previous month or two months ago. Now, I mentioned this book um, in my video about the future classics text that I hadn't read it yet, and but that I thought it would be a future classic, um, and I felt so bad that I hadn't read it that the next day or the day after I, I bought it, um, you can see it, the picture um, I put up, I bought it as an ebook and I read it. Now, Rennie Edo Lodge, Edo Lodge is a British, a young British uh, uh, author, a journalist. She was born in 1989, um, and she, her focus uh, is feminism and racism. Uh, now, first about the title of the book, why I'm no longer talking uh, to white people about race. In 2014, um, Rennie Ada Lodge, uh, she had a blog uh, back then, and she uh, posted a blog post uh, with the title, Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race, in which she voiced her frustration, how difficult, is t how difficult it is for her to have a meaningful conversation with uh, white people, or at least not all of them, she makes that clear in the in the blog post, which is included in the book. But a lot of white people, um, uh, she has having difficulties of having a meaningful conversation because it seems that um, the white person she talks with cannot grasp 
the structural um, um, racism in Britain. And they, as if we just don't know what she's talking about. And she's frustrated about that because she has to explain it over and over again. This blog post, you know, uh, went viral and she got a lot of response and she decided um, to write a broader book about the issue, which is the book that is has been published now. And as she says in the book, um, now she probably doesn't do anything else but talking mostly to white people about race. Um, the book is um, uh, looking at race from various, uh, at racism from various perspectives. First, she talks about the origins of racism, um, British history, how they were entangled with slavery, um, and then she looks at uh, police, law enforcement, law giving, the position of black people in the community. Uh, she looks at feminism uh, and how much of feminism is very white and doesn't address the specific uh, problems for a black woman. So she, she picks various uh, subjects, historical, but also uh, subjects that uh, topics that are relevant now um, and explores them uh, in with the, the, the question in mind, how does racism manifest? And her um, claim, uh, which I think is very valid, how she, uh, how, how she argue, the arguments she puts forward and also how she explains it, is that her point is that uh, in, in Britain, in the UK, uh, racism is something, th something structural, embedded in the structure of society. So she doesn't talk about racism in the sense of incidents, of, you know, racial outbursts. She mentions those, like, you know, violent clashes between white and black uh, communities and, and uh, things like that. But her point is much more that we have to address racism as a structural problem. Like I said, embedded in the society. And I thought that was very interesting and very well argued. So, it's for sure an important book. I only have one yeah, disappointment um, because if, if you follow her argument that, you know, race is something uh, structural, uh, racism is something structural and that uh, we have to address the fact um, uh, that we don't want to be colorblind, but we want to have uh, people being able to have their uh, black identity. But the point she doesn't address is the fact that the black community in Europe, in the UK, because she is, you know, uh, she's only addressing the history and the status of black people in the UK, that they are a minority, which has its own problems and difficulties and challenges. Um, black people will always be wherever you are, whether you are at school or in, in, at work or university or in a, in a community, black people will overall in the country always be the minority and you have to address that position in my point of view if you want to make a political statement. You have to say, for instance, that a solution is, you know, to surround yourself um, with people where you are not in the minority or whether that is not a good idea to do. But not addressing that issue at all, what it means to be part of a minority, I was disappointed about that. But for the rest, I think if you want to um, have a good look at structural racism in the UK in particular, but the book gives, you know, a much broader perspective if you read it, then I can certainly recommend it with this one, you know, issue that I was disappointed that she didn't address it. And I think I said four books at the start of this video, but it's only three, obviously. So anyway, this was it for my recent Sunday, my recent reads on a Sunday. Uh, thank you very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, let me know in the comments down below whether you read any of the books and in particular the, the last one, why I'm no longer talking to white people about race, what you think of the, um, the, the point I made about addressing the fact that in the UK, black people are a minority. 
um, and let me know what you read recently and I'll see you all soon in my next video. Bye bye!